so welcome everybody. Bonsoir pour ceux qui sont en France. Hello. And welcome to Beyond Scrum Mastering. Uh, just a word maybe about the meetup for the, those who are here for the first time. Uh, so we created this meetup two years ago, uh, really to be a place to exchange on our experience and learn together uh, beyond methodologies uh, on how we coach teams on their agile journey. So we really wanted to have a place to talk about what we live uh, day to day and what difficulties we encounter and how we can help each other learn about that uh, different things than what we have in uh, Scrum Guide or other guides or, or guidelines. So I'm very, very happy to have Diana Larsen with us tonight. Thank you very much, Diana, to join us. Uh, My pleasure. All the way from Portland. <laughs> uh, And yes, I, I personally really like your work. Uh, I said it before, but uh, your your work on the uh, your the book you you co-wrote on agile retrospective was really a big help for me when I started as Scrum Master. Mm -hmm. And now that I coach teams, I use the agile fluency model as well, and it really helps me to uh, yes to to coach the teams on their agile journey. So I'm really glad to have you tonight and. Uh, So you can talk more with us about that topic. Yeah. Um, so I have with me also on the Beyond Scrum Mastering team, uh, Julien and Emily, who will help uh, tonight. And uh, to take all your questions, we will uh, we'll try Slido. Uh, so we, you, can, uh, uh, you can write your questions on Slido and you can vote also on your favorite questions. So you, we know which ones to take in priority. Um, and we also start with a small survey on Slido. So Julien put the link on, uh, on the conversation in Zoom. Done, it's done, just yeah. done. So you can go on Slido and uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with a small survey to know how well do you know the Agile Fluency model? So if you have any trouble going on Slido or if you have questions about that, you can also uh, ask us about it on the conversation or just uh, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask if you have any difficulties. And yes, I forgot to say, but on Slido, we'll, uh, We'll call you to ask your question. So if you want to be called and ask your question yourself to Diana, you can, don't forget to put your name. So I know who to call. And to start, maybe Diana, do you like to um, introduce yourself and tell us a few words about your career and your experience in the Agile world? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Oops. Uh, okay, oh, yes, let's see what happened. Right. I just showed up very big on my screen. Uh, <laughs> um, so I've been, um, you know, as you can tell by looking at me, I've had a long career. Uh, and my career started um, with uh, be being involved with instructional design and, um, and employee development. And um, in the 80s and in the 90s, I had, by the time the 90s rolled around, I had actually sort of shifted that into, um, into more organization development, organization design, and, and specifically work process design, uh, working with organizations whose work processes weren't giving them the outcomes they wanted and helping them to decide how to adjust that and then helping to manage the change after and helping the managers to know how to manage differently because in every single one of the projects that I was in, the group of people uh, that we were working with decided that they wanted to reorganize their work process into self-managing, self-organizing teams, cross-functional teams. And so from the instructional design beginnings through that uh, work redesign, my career has always been about helping people learn and 
discovering ways that people learn and discovering ways that we can create environments where they learn better. And uh, so that's always been a part of my work. And then in the very late 90s, um, I attended an event where I got to meet a number of the folks who ended up being signers of the Agile Manifesto. It was a, an event that was more software development focused. My career has always been primarily in high tech or IT uh, arenas, engineering companies, those kinds of things. Uh, that's been been where I felt most comfortable. And so I had been invited to this event where I, I met this group of people. And we began talking about what they were doing because by that time they had already begun publishing and thinking about and experimenting with their ideas around extreme programming and, and some scrum, uh, not as much in that in the particular group that I met. And they were very interested in my work with work process design and what happened when people formed into teams to do their work and so on. So we found some, some nice affinity there. And uh, out, out of that, um, that experience, Kent Beck asked me to write a commentary. He, he had two, two, he was editing two issues of the Cutter IT Journal about embrace change and um, and the extreme changing to extreme programming in organizations. He's collecting articles from people, and he asked me to review those articles and write a commentary that got published there. And so that was really my first published piece where I was taking what I had learned and putting it together with something that eventually was a part of the agile uh, world. And then by the time 2001 rolled around and, um, and the Agile Manifesto was written, I had already been through a one week extreme programming boot camp and had begun working with Joshua Karievsky around doing presentations um, at conferences to talk about what did people need to know in order to manage the kind of change that it meant to go from being groups of individual contributors to working in self-organizing cross-functional teams. And, um, and so things just kept rolling along. Uh, shortly after that, I met uh, Esther Derby. She and I had already begun working with Norm Kurth on his work in big project reviews and project retrospectives. And so she and I uh, early on began work on writing the Agile Retrospectives book. Uh, I became part of the Agile Alliance Board of Directors. Um, I did that for a number of years and um, just became part of the Agile community and really shifted all, pretty much all of my consulting and coaching work into things that were most relevant to the Agile space. Um, in 2011 and then in 2000, a little bit later, we wrote a second edition. Ainsley Neese and I wrote a book called Liftoff which was about how, when you bring people together to work as a team, how do you give them the best possible start? Um, and, then, and then of course, uh, James Shore and I created the Agile Fluency Model. And uh, my, I worked with my son, Willem Larson, to write a book called The Five Rules of Accelerated Learning. Uh, really focused on the fact that software teams are, have learning work to do and how do they best manage that work. So, like I said, there's been the through thread through all my career about helping people learn, helping people improve their lot in life uh, in order to, uh, by learning better and by applying what they learn and bringing what I knew from my original background in um, employee development, organization development, organization design into the agile space where I saw there were places where people hadn't talked about a significant issue a lot, like continuous improvement and retrospectives or starting teams well and doing the liftoffs and so on. And so now, um, I, you know, after 30 some years of being a coach and a consultant in that space, um, in 2015, James Shore and I started the Agile Fluency Project 
to begin teaching what we had learned through all of our experience in coaching and consulting and begin to trend and using the agile fluency model as a lens for how to help people, help organizations. Um, we, we formed the Agile Fluency Project and I've been, ever since then, I've been working primarily through the Agile Fluency Project to help other coaches and consultants to um, achieve what they want to achieve. And here we are today. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. So we have uh, some results on the uh, on the poll. So how well do people here know the Agile Fluency model? So for now, we have thirty eight percent of people that doesn't that don't. Uh, it's changing as I talk. Okay. <laughs> 43% of people that uh, don't know about the model, 50% that I've read about it, and 7% that use it to coach agile teams. Okay. Well, so I've got just a few slides. I will run through them very quickly and just do a quick overview of the model and the project and some of the things that we're doing. And, um, and maybe that for those folks that don't even know enough about it to ask a question yet, maybe that will spark some questions in your mind. And, and I'm happy to, um, I'm, even if you consider yourself a beginner, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions because beginner questions often are the ones that open up the most learning for everyone. So please don't, please, feel free to ask whatever question occurs to you. None of the questions will be stupid or useless. They will all be valuable questions and we wanna hear all of them. So let me just, do I have permission to share my screen? I do, all right. So um, what we at the Agile Fluency uh, project now are doing is we've developed a suite of materials, but the foundation for sure is the Agile Fluency model. And um, I'm going to go through very fast here. Uh, there's a little bit slower description on the homepage of our website, agilefluency.org. Um, and then there's a, a free downloadable ebook that is a more complete description of what the model does and is. And um, on our blog, on our website blog, we have posted the, um, the translation into French that Niels made of the original, of the article that is an overview of this. So there's lots of different places where you can learn more if what I'm giving you is insufficient, which most likely it will be. So um, the agile fluency model is, is, comes out of the idea that people, in order to do their jobs at, well, people need a certain amount of fluency in the skills to do that job. For instance, I don't get to speak French very often. I've studied a lot of French in my life, mostly when I was younger. Um, and the only time I've really gotten to use it has been on the few occasions when I have been a tourist in France. So it became clear to me that my need for fluency in French was to be able to be a, an adequate tourist, to get the things done I need to get done as a tourist, to find a bus stop or find my way to the hotel or order food or things like that, give greetings, right? To be polite. Um, I don't need enough fluency to teach a college class or even enough fluency to hang over the back fence and have a conversation about what happened last weekend with my neighbors. I don't need that much fluency. And what James and I realized was the same thing was true in the agile world that some teams needed different levels or different collections of fluency than others. And it didn't make sense for companies to invest in teams being able to teach college classes if really what they wanted was just to be able to um, 
do the equivalent of asking and answering important questions. So uh, that's what that's why we call it the agile fluency model. That's the genesis of it. We always talk to people about different things that they do in their lives where they might have more or less or different kinds of fluency that are just fine for what they need. Uh, playing the piano is another example. Some people just want to be able to play the piano well enough to for their own satisfaction. Other people want to play Christmas carols for their for their families at Christmas time. Other people want to be concert pianists, very different fluency, but, but adequate to the thing that people want to do. So that's where the model came from. And when we took that lens, we realized uh, that there seemed to be four general sort of chunks of fluency that we saw out there that, that teams would be performing. Just like for me, tourist, uh, casual conversation, living in a neighborhood, opening a business might be different levels of fluency. Um, for teams, we came up with this idea that focusing, delivering, optimizing, and strengthening were the four, four kinds of fluency that, that we saw teams needing. And we left this little uh, stub out on the end of the model here because we're beginning to see some an, an additional zone. I, we don't know how many zones may be out there, but we, we've begun to see at least one additional one, but we don't see enough of it yet to actually describe it well. So we're leaving space for it, but we don't know that the model is complete yet, but it's complete enough for pretty much all the teams that I end up working with. So here's another view of that model. Um, there are lots of different things that go along with each of these zones. And we start with this idea, uh, the, the sense of being a team being pre-agile. In other words, they, they're not using any agile practices. Maybe they don't need to. That may be it also be a fine zone for them to be in. It's not particularly interesting to us. So we didn't spend a lot of time describing it. <laughs> But once, once an organization or a team decides, no, we really do need the benefits that um, moving into Agile will give us, then we get interested. And that's where our fluency zones come in. And so the first zone uh, comes about when people decide to work together as a team. There are a set of benefits that you can get from being a part of a focusing team. Um, just for me, you know, getting around from my uh, from my hotel to a shopping area if I'm being a tourist is a benefit that I need. Um, there are certain benefits that uh, businesses need from teams in the focusing zone, and if if that team can can deliver on or produce all of these benefits, that may be all the organization needs. And the other thing that we show on this card, and by the way, this card is available to you. If you go to our website and you uh, click on down at the bottom, the contact us, you can request a PDF of this particular graphic and we're happy to send it to you. You can also decide if you want to get our newsletter or not on the same screen. And, um, and then you can have a copy of this that you can share with other folks and, and discuss if you like. But the other thing that, we, that goes along with each of these zones is there are certain investments that if the organization hasn't already made these investments, they may need to make in order to enable the team to be fluent in this zone. Um, we have a short description of what kinds of practices we often see people using in this zone, what, what method, methodology sets, what frameworks, and about how long it takes. If you're starting from no Agile at all and you want to achieve fluency in this zone, how long does that usually take? And so we have that for each of these zones. So there's the focusing zone, then similarly, the delivering zone has has all of these benefits, but then all of these additional benefits as well. Uh, it really focuses on getting the really good solid software engineering skills into the team. There are some new challenges that need to be invested in. This is where Agile becomes more sustainable, more works for more long-term projects. 
um, and it takes longer to become fluent here. And so that's the delivering zone. And then we, from there, we can still go further um, and move to the optimizing zone. This is where the team really has more control over the whole product and is more cross-functional, includes more different voices from around the organization as a part of the team. And um, so there's more business involvement in the team here. And um, like daily involvement, not just as not just in having a product owner. And uh, that re generally requires a shift in the organizational structure. There are certain investments to be made. This is often what we think of as the promise of agile. When people say, you know, do you have agile teams and do you have the agile mindset? And are you really being agile as well as doing agile? Optimizing zone is often what they mean by that. Um, in our experience, only about 15% of the teams that we work with uh, or organizations that we work with, do they want only about 15% of their teams to be optimizing teams, which is an interesting uh, understanding. And then uh, finally, there's this last zone that's the strengthening zone. We don't see this in large organizations at all. <laughs> Uh, we really usually only see the first three in larger organizations, but in uh, smaller, more nimble organizations and startups in companies that have decided to stay small, we will often see some of these attributes uh, of the teams that they've spun up. The teams are more connected with the overall uh, organizational goals and businesses and in moving those forward, where um, on these earlier in these earlier zones, people tend to be more, the teams tend to be more connected to their, to their product. Um, so that's the model. And after we published the model uh, and people began reading about it, uh, Martin Fowler was uh, lovely and offered to publish our model in the beginning and it's still up on his website. Um, the, after, after people began reading about the model, they started coming to us with questions. And they said, how do we know where our teams are now? If we can figure out where we'd like our teams, what, what fluency zone we'd like our teams to be in, how do we know where they are now? So how can we figure out what are the right investments to make? And so in response to that, we created an instrument called the Agile Fluency Diagnostic which is not so much an assessment of how good your team is or not. It's more uh, holding up a mirror to the team to let them see how well or not well they are able to do the currently able to do the things that their organization wants them, wants and needs from them. And, um, and then by, pulling together all the results from many, many teams, we can show leaders of the organization where they can make the most valuable investments that will help the most possible teams. So it's not about judging the teams, are you fluent enough or not? It's about where are we on our fluency journey and what's going to be the th best thing to take us to our to the next step and the next level and to increasing our fluency? So we do that. We can do that as a as an observational assessment, uh, going and sitting with teams, seeing what they're doing, talking to people about that, getting getting a sense of that, uh, or we can speed that process up a little by using the diagnostic. Sometimes we do one. Sometimes when we do the other. And then finally, uh, as we are using these materials, we follow what we call the agile fluency improvement cycle, which as you can see here, starts with really, with understanding the organization's needs from the leader's point of view, then bringing in some kind of a fluency diagnostic or, or observations to figure out where the teams are now and, and what is the difference between where they are now and where the organization needs them to be, and then begins the process of creating an investment plan uh, and starting to do the coaching with the teams that they need to make, make a difference. One of the things that makes this a different improvement 
model than uh, or a different change management model than a lot of them is that we are explicit about all the many kinds of feedback loops that need to be built in in order to keep this going and the idea that we do this in very small steps the investment planning that we do is maybe for the next three months um, and then you know, with just a glimmer of the three months after that. And then that continues on a rolling basis. So we always have a sense of what's next. But then we're also always checking back to say, and here's what we've accomplished so far. Here's what we're seeing so far. Does this seem to be moving us in the right direction and so forth? Some of our, uh, the people that we have licensed to use these, this suite of materials uh, are using OKRs. Some folks are using SAFE. Some folks are using just the various uh, incarnations of Scrum. Um, this model and these ways of working are method and framework agnostic. Um, what we want is for every organization to get the agile that they need, wherever that comes from and whatever it looks like. And so what we want to do is provide materials and ways of looking at things that help a consultant or a coach or a leader in an organization to figure out what really are our best next steps in order to uh, get the benefits of Agile that we need. And so at the Agile Fluency model, we've provided a number of resources. Uh, there's a free downloadable ebook. I'm happy to send these slides out as well um, up on request. So just Again, just write to the contact us. I will send you the slides. Uh, you can explore the whole website. On the home page of the website is a 10-minute video that goes into a little more depth on that big landscape graphic that was back there. Uh, we have blog posts. That's where you'll find the French version of our Agile Fluency article. You can contact us. Um, James Shore, my business partner and collaborator on the Agile Fluency model, is rewriting his classic Agile book, The Art of Agile Development, in a second edition. He is making that, as he is completing it, he is making it uh, publicly available for review. And O'Reilly has already put up a pre-release version so that you can see some of the parts that he's already written. And a, and a lot of the parts he's already written relate to the Agile Fluency model. So that's another good place to look for that. And we offer, uh, we also offer workshops and other kinds of events. We do monthly town halls, um, which are kind of meetups, Agile Fluency related meetups um, and those kinds of things. And those are all available on our website. So if you want to learn more besides asking me questions today, um, this, is a, this is the best place to go to, to find out more of those solutions. So I hope I didn't use up too much of our time with that, but I'm happy to stick around as long as we need to answer everyone's questions. Okay, thank you, Diana. Um, I think we have a first question from Rachel. Rachel, si tu veux venir poser ta question. Hello, yes, thank you. Hello, Diana, and thank you for Hello. sharing your... Your model was asked tonight. So my question is, um, when it comes to... Uh, uh, coaching teams using the model, what are the anti-patterns that you have seen, the misusage of it that you have seen um, uh -huh. across, uh, coaching? Because I guess the model yeah. and the drawing might stimulate some some of those ones. And how do you handle those ones, please? Um, well, the first anti-pattern that we see most commonly is people want to turn it into a maturity model. They want to say, well, obviously we need all our teams to be in the strengthening zone because that's the furthest along the path. And that's, you know, that has to be the ultimate goal. And in fact, it's not. <laughs> uh, in fact, strengthening is not a good idea for a lot of organizations. For most organizations, it's not a good idea. Uh, it just would create too much disruption. As you noticed in that one slide, we couldn't even put a time frame on how long it would take to get there. If you started there and you stay there and grow there, that can work. But even then, um, in the very beginning, 
when we first started to some people talking to some people at a well-known music startup, um, when they were small, they uh, brought in the agile fluency model and did a lot of good work with it and had teams that were working in that strengthening zone. But over time, as they grew to be international and multinational and to take on more and more different kinds of services, the communication overhead became too big. And so the last time I spoke with those folks, um, that one of the managers told me that we have, he said, we have a few teams that are optimizing zone teams. And, and so we have to be able to support optimizing zone teams as a company, but uh, we only have a few folks that we need to do the kind of R and D work and the whole, keeping the whole product in mind kind of work that's, that is done there. Most of our teams are delivering zone teams, they said, because we, we need to keep servicing our existing features and keep, keep incrementally improving our, our versions and, and keep moving those along. And we need that to be kind of a continuous flow of value to our customers. And he said, and then we have a few, few teams that are working in marketing on short-term projects or are working with, um, are working in our IT department that have shorter term projects that are focusing zone teams. So two anti-patterns are captured there. One is people think they need to be at the top, which is actually why we turned the model on its head. And we have the start at the top and, the, <laughs> and strengthening at the bottom because we wanted to disrupt that idea that there, you know, that there was a, a path that you wanted to follow all the way to the end. Uh, we just want you to follow the path as far as it is serving you. And, um, and so, so that's one anti-pattern. And then the other anti-pattern is people assuming that every team in their organization needs to be the same uh, because they don't. It, we really need to look at the nature of the work and what kind of work is going on in the team and so on. So those are two that I've experienced myself. Um, I don't get a lot of insight into experiences that other people who are using the model are running into. Um, we, we have some conversations in our community network, um, but those, those have not come up as much. And those are really two of the biggest ones. Um, or people, if people are too attached to one particular framework, um, then they get them, coaches or consultants are too attached to one particular framework. I only do Scrum and I only do something that's in the Scrum world. And I would never consider Kanban and I would never consider, I don't look outside to extreme programming engineering practices or any of the other things that are out there. Um, they get in trouble because they want to try to shoehorn the ideas of Scrum into all of the zones. And they don't, it doesn't really fit everywhere. It fits some places very well. Uh, other places, it doesn't fit as well. So that's, that's another one. So those are a few of the ones that we run into. Um, on the maturity question, we are beginning to think that if there is a maturity question for teams in the model, it is within the zones. Because once, once, a, once a group of leaders says, we need these, these teams here, we need them to be delivering zone teams, and we do a diagnostic with them and we see, well, they don't yet have all of the skills and proficiencies that they're gonna need. They're gonna need some investments uh, to enable them to reach fluency there. So they're going to start out less fluent in that zone. They may be very fluent in the focusing zone, but they're not that fluent in the delivering zone. And then over time, there are some definitions for how they get better and better at doing the work of that zone and delivering the benefits of that zone. And we think if there's maturity anywhere, it may be in, inside the zones, not between them. Does that make sense, Rachel? Thank you a lot. Yeah. It's consistent with what I observed. So thank you a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so next question is one of mine and I will choose the one about the zone because you just talked about them. Uh, how do you help a team choose the zone that is more appropriate for, for the team? 
because you talked about the problem that we don't, uh, yeah. um, you know, if we think about going further and how do you help them realize what's best for them? Well, uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, in that, the first thing we do is we, we work with leaders. We don't start by working with teams. We start by working with leaders of teams. Um, and and at higher level leaders, uh, people who are setting business direction or or determining what products are going to be developed, uh, what you know, where are we going to put emphasis in our product portfolio? Those folks, and we talk with them about uh, to to determine in order to accomplish what they want to accomplish for the business, what zone teams are they going to need? And so they tell us, uh, well, given that these are the benefits associated with each of the zones, and of course we do a deeper dive than we just did right now, but, but uh, if these are the benefits associated with the, with the zones, we've got these six teams over here that we might need to be focusing teams. And we've got these 12 teams over here that we need to be delivering teams. And we've got, we've got two new products that we're, we're, prototyping and thinking about. So we might need those two, we might need two optimizing zone teams, right? So we would have that kind of a conversation and the leaders would tell us what benefits do you need from your teams? And that tells us what zones the teams need to, need to be able to function in. And then, um, then we go to the teams. Once we have that information, we get permission and we go to the teams and like I said, we either sit with them and observe what they're doing and have lots and lots of conversations with them, or we have maybe one conversation with them and then we do a diagnostic and then bring the results of that back to the team um, and say, okay, so here's what you said your team is doing now, not what we said you were doing, or, or here's how I observed you doing these things. Very very experience-based and here's what you know so if you did the diagnostic here's where you what you said you were doing here's the things you said you did all the time here are the things you said you only do sometimes um and and let's show that to you and now the and that goes across all the zones here are the things you're doing across all the zones here are the things that you only do sometimes across all the zones here's the things that you don't pay any attention to at all which may be fine depending on the zone and um and then we show that result to the team members and we ask them to make observations about what they all say together. So the diagnostic is done by individual team members. So then what we show back to the team is what the collection of everything they have said, completely anonymous. Nobody knows what, who said what, right? Um, but we can have a conversation and sometimes people will say, well, I was the one that voted that way on that item, right? But then they say, well, as, so as a team, we think, you know, if we look at all of our answers and we kind of rationalize them and come to a consensus on each of these things, um, this is where we think we are as a team. Then we say, this is what your organization has asked for you to be. And at that point, we had the organization's opportunity to say, congratulations, you're doing everything your organization wants you to do. Or, uh-oh. <laughs> that you're, there's some things that your organization still needs from you that you aren't able to produce yet. What, what, can, what can you make a difference in at your team level, given this picture? And where do you need help from the organization in order to be able to give them what they want from you? And then after we've had that conversation with a lot of teams and we take that back to the leadership and we aggregate everything all the teams have said so nobody can tell what team said what a lot of confidentiality maintained all the way through here but we bring that back to the leaders and we say given what all your teams are or all the teams that you wanted to be delivering teams 
all of the, the them are showing us this profile. Um, they are telling us that what the, the best help you could give them is giving them more access to their product owner. They're, they're too many teams are sharing one product owner and they don't get their questions asked. Or um, they, uh, they know that uh, you need a continuous flow of delivery, but too many of the teams still don't have any kind of internal production environment that they can, that they can commit into so that they can see how things are integrating or not and, and do continuous integration and that sort of thing. So whatever it is that we're seeing more broadly across all the teams, that's what we're reporting back to the leaders and saying, here's where you could make a real difference in enabling these teams. Um, give them better, um, another big one is better uh, online remote working and collab remote collaboration tools. Um, I was shocked uh, about four months into the pandemic when pretty much everyone was working from home, how many teams still had no video capability or the, they had video capability, but only to see the, the system that they were working in. They could only see the code. They couldn't see each other at all. And they were working from phones and, and, and then the code on the screen. And it's like, there's no team in the world is going to be able to collaborate effectively that way. That's, that's tying their hands. They cannot do, uh, be fully collaborative that way and work well together. So here you need to be able to, you need to provide them with some kind of tool that's gonna to allow them to see each other. You need to provide them with blah, blah, blah. So, so those are the kinds of things that happen. We, we, we discover, we do this process of discovery where we learn where the organization hasn't yet made investments in what the teams need in order to do the work that the organization wants them to do. And, um, and so that's, um, that's how we, that's how we handle that. And then, and then again, all those feedback loops, then we do a little bit of work uh, on enabling the teams, and then we check in again, and how's it going? And are you getting more fluent in these areas? And uh, is, do we need to make a new plan? Or is there something new, that sort of thing? Thank you, Diana, for your answer. Uh, Massimo, do you want to ask your question now? I don't know, Massimo, maybe oh, yeah. you're muted. Hello, hello, hello. 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 Uh, sorry, I got some issue with my mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, um, I, I, I don't know much about uh, Agile for instance, model. So I've, uh, I think I've uh, seen your presentation last year in uh, Venice, uh, well, in mm -hmm. Venice through the web. Um, very interesting from my point of view. Um, I've got a question, um, which is uh, very linked to my specific work. Do you think that uh, this model, the Agile fluency model, can be applied to a context which are out, no IT, meaning like Agile for hardware or something like that. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's very, um, lately is, it has become a, an important issue, this Agile right. for hardware. What yeah. is your, your feeling about that? Yes. And your experience um, of, of the course. Well, I've gotten this question, we've gotten this question for a long time. And uh, for m the first several years, my answer was always, these are descriptions of software team behavior. We were looking at agile software teams. And so each of these zones describes software team behavior. Um, and so we really resisted any implication that it could be used beyond that. And I still think that uh, that's in its current state, that is primarily what I think. But when I go into an organization that also wants to develop greater agility in their marketing department or their legal department or whatever, I do go back to the model and I say, well, if we're just trying to get them to work together as a collaborative team and get the benefits of that, and that's all we need, 
what can I borrow out of the focusing zone that's going to fit this situation? And when I do that, I find that the focusing zone, the optimizing zone, and the strengthening zone actually translate more easily across functions. The, the, the delivering zone um, is very software engineering skills specific. So there we have to do a little more work. We have to say, you know, what is it that's most important to the, these customers? Is it the continuous flow of value like it is for a lot of software companies or is it something different? And then what are the highest level professional skills that this group of people need in order to make that happen? And then I sort of translate that into the delivering zone area for that function. I haven't written any of that up. I do it kind of on the fly based on what the people in that particular organization are telling me. So I wouldn't say that you can just apply the Agile Fluency model to any, any kind of work, but I think you can use it as a guide to look for how, does, how do organizations have different needs in certain functions for for their teams. I mean, if you're not working in teams, it doesn't work at all. But if you're looking at make doing using teams, then uh, you can you can use it to make some translations, I think. Um, at least I've been able to do that. And I know a couple of my colleagues have. Um, but most but most of our experience is with software teams. Thank you very much. That, does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, it makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The time is flying very fast. Yeah. <laughs> I have a hard time with short answers, but <laughs> we have only uh, less. We have less than ten minutes left. Okay. So I don't know how many questions we can take in that little time, and we also had one last question that we wanted to uh, end with. Uh, so maybe we'll end with one last question now. What do you think, sure. Diana? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Julien, maybe do you want to ask that question? I'm really sorry about all the questions that haven't been answered yet, It's, uh, but it's really yeah. Well, and I will make the offer. If, if anyone has questions, um, I can pop that resource slide back up again. You can take a screenshot of it so you know all the links. And if anybody has questions that don't get answered today, Feel free to go to our contact us and put your question in the in the text box there, and I can answer it um, later. Yeah. Thank you, Diana, for that offer. Yeah. Julien. Yes. Uh, uh, our question is uh, from the Beyond the Scrum Mastering team. It's actually a two part question. Mm -hmm. And the first part is, what do you think about the state of Agile nowadays in organization? And the second part is, what do you think awaits us for the future in the Agile world? And what are you hope, your hopes <laughs> for the future? Oh, a nice short question for the end. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so part of the reason that we have the Agile Fluency model is that, you know, years ago, 10 years ago now, James Shore and I were looking around at what we were seeing, what we saw going on in various kinds of Agile transitions, adoptions, transformations, journeys, whatever people want to call them. And, and feeling like, People like companies weren't getting the benefits that they thought they would get by their shift to Agile, and partly because they weren't making the right investments in order to make that happen. Um, and you know, they wanted to they wanted to do something simple, so they bought a package deal that somebody created for some other organization, and then came in and slapped it on them. And uh, as a woman of a larger size in this world, uh, a larger woman in this world, if there's anything I know, I know that one size does not fit all, right? And it doesn't fit all in clothing and it doesn't fit all in uh, when you're trying to do an agile uh, adoption, 
uh, or adapt agile for your company. So that's partly why we, why we created the model is because we felt bad that that was happening, that there are a lot of people who said, oh yes, my organization is agile, but they weren't getting the benefits and they weren't giving the teams the support that agile teams need to have in order to do their best work. And so, you know, reading job descriptions that were, oh, we need a, a tech lead who can be agile, but then they described a whole bunch of stuff that didn't fit with agile at all, or, you know, those kinds of things were happening all over the place. And so we, our vision for the agile fluency project and for spreading the word about the agile fluency model was we wanna see agile done well, giving benefit to in every organization that says it's doing agile. And uh, what Jim and I realize is that we don't scale. We, we, we can't touch that many organizations. And so that's why we started spread, you know, offering out our materials to other people so that they could, they could use them as well. And, and people who were hungry, we run into a lot of, lot of coaches and consultants who really are hungry to be able to think about an agile transition in more than one way, that there's not just one answer for every company. And, um, and we have no argument with any of the frameworks or methodologies. You know, we think that all of them fit some places, but none of them fit every place. And so what we want is for coaches and consultants to be able to be discerning about that, to ask the right questions, to help leaders figure out what's going to be the right fit for them. Um, so anyway, so, you know, Ron Jeffrey started talking about dark scrum. Other people started talking about fragile. Um, you know, there's a lot of criticism out there about how agile is being applied. Um, I, I can't say that I'm surprised. I mean, I was around for a lot of the total quality movement and the lean movement and um, every, every good idea that comes along gets misapplied because people start looking for shortcuts. We're human, you know, for whatever reason, we, we don't want to take our time with a thing. We want to find the quick answer, apply it, particularly in U.S. business culture and Western business culture, apply it and then move on. Excuse me. <coughs> ah, I can get to my mute quick enough there. <laughs> um, so it's not surprising. It's disappointing. You know, we hoped Agile would be more rigorously applied, but it, it just hasn't been. Um, but I am hopeful because I see a lot of parallel movements going on. Folks who are talking about Semco style, uh, the beyond budgeting movement, People who are looking more at uh, the corporate rebels who are looking more and more at alternative business, uh, alternative governance structures, the Business Agility Institute that is looking at how do we spread agility more widely across the organization. Um, there are more and more, even the organization design community um, is, is looking more and more about how do we make our organizations, yes, more productive, but also more sustainable, both in long-term longevity of the company and environmentally sustainable and more humane. How do we take better care of our people? And so I see a lot of movement in that direction. And um, Steve Denning has talked about 21st century management and moving away from 20th century management. Um, so that makes me hopeful. And it's, you know, when we're talking about worldwide trends like this, uh, we're talking about things that might take a generation to really shift. So it's not something that we necessarily, particularly me, um, are going to see in the next five years or the next 10 years, or even for me, even in my lifetime. You may see it in your lifetimes. Um, but uh, it, so it's a slow process when we're talking uh, I mean, it's difficult for a family to make a change, let alone an organization of, you know, thousands of people. So, um, so I'm hopeful. This is the short answer there for the future. Thank you very much, Diana.
uh, to have been with us tonight, to, tonight today for you this yeah. morning, <laughs> and uh, to have answered our question and share your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and asking all your questions. Uh, it's been a nice time. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other in the future. So the meetup has been recorded. We'll put the link online uh, later. And you can give us your feedbacks again on Slido. We've opened, uh, we've opened uh, a question so you can give us all your feedbacks. And we'll be happy to have them and improve also for next time. And I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn. So that's two other places besides uh, the agilefluency.org that you can contact me or, or just connect with me. Um, just let me know that, that, that um, our connection came about because of this, uh, this meetup. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. All. Thank you, Diana. Have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.